My name is Shara Bangeter, and what an honor and a blessing to be able to bear my testimony to you today. Brothers and sisters, we are living in a world of change. It is full of challenges and changes, and we just can't escape it, can we? But amidst all this change, there are constants and there are truths that can anchor us to the Savior. They keep us protected, comforted, and filled with his power and joy. President Nelson says that no matter our circumstances, as we focus our lives on Christ, we can be filled with joy. I rejoice in God's love, his mercy, because I know I am never alone. I know God lives. I know he loves us. And he knows us. He is in charge. His son is our savior, atoning for us all with incredible compassion. I'm never alone because I hear him. I love him. I want to do his will for he has always led me, guided me, protected me through all the changes and the challenges of my life. On Sunday morning, September 12th, about two months ago, I was asked to substitute for a primary lesson, a primary class. So I was studying the lesson. It was all about how our adversities can be for our good. I was listening to some beautiful music too. The words were like, slow down, be still and know that I am God. Oh, the spirit was so, so strong. Little did I know that my father in heaven was preparing me for a big change it was just about to happen to my mortal world. Garrett Bangeter is my handsome husband. We were married and sealed in the St. George Temple about three years ago. Garrett's only son, Brandon, had planned a weekend father-son fishing trip in celebration of Garrett's recent birthday. They had a very, very close relationship. They had a great time, but they got off late Saturday night, but Garrett wanted to get home in time for church, and so they left. Brandon started driving. He had the wheel, but he got tired and he told his dad, hey, I'm tired. And so Garrett wasn't tired, he said, so he took over the wheel. He must have dozed for just a second, hit the rumble strips and started to turn and overcorrected. In that process of spinning, he turned and he started to roll down the berm through the deer fence and landed upright. Brandon had been killed instantly. And Garrett was trapped in there for about five hours until somebody could see him because it was dark. He was then air flighted to St. George Hospital there in the morning time. And I got the call as I was finishing up my primary lesson. When I got to the emergency room, I found him laying there on the table. He was able to talk to me very coherently. He knew what had happened and he actually looked pretty good. He had no concussion no major broken bones, except for a lot of broken ribs and a small puncture in his lung that they had to put a tiny chest tube to help drain that. The doctors there in the emergency room told me that he looked so good that he should be able to go home with me in like two or three days. I was ecstatic, it was a miracle. He made great progress the first two days. He was in the ICU and then he got transferred up to the next room. He continued to do well that third day. It went really well. And, but at nighttime, he went into this altered state, they called it. At first I thought it was because he had too many pain meds or maybe the anguish of uh, what had happened to his son. But I was later very, very grateful that a sweet sister helped me interpret this to mean that he was just very, very close to the veil. That night, it was all about pre-construction meetings. My husband is a, is a home builder, so is, Gar is his son, Brandon. So pre-construction meetings were a big deal. He was asking me, did you get the plans? Did you get the appointments? We've got to prepare for this pre-construction meeting. I'm like, Garrett, there's no pre-construction meeting. Well, that was it, and that's what he knew. The next day, he was back to Garrett again. It was like, oh, happy day. That, that day also went really, really well. He was walking around, although he hated all those tubes that were connected to him. And I even helped him shower and he got the chest tube out and Garrett even, this is very sweet. He had us both kneel down on that hard hospital floor next to his bed. And he offered that last family prayer. It was such a sweet, precious moment to hear him. 
The doctor said everything looked really good. And we'd probably be going home that next day. So that last night, he went also again into that altered state. This time, he was telling me that there was somebody coming into the room that we need to prepare for him. I said, what? How do you know? He said, that's written right there. And it was that whiteboard that was in, the, in, in our room about how the nurses like, made notes on it. I, I couldn't see anything. And I said, what? He said, yes, we need to prepare for this person coming into my room and that there's a conference. We need to prepare for that. It's, that was it. That was what he knew. And no matter how many things I would try and say to him, it was that. So both of these last two nights, he was very, very restless. Um, I know this because I slept right there with him all these days, right there in his little hospital room. At 1.30, the nurses came to try to calm him down. And I went over to him. I said, Garrett, Garrett, I'm here, honey. And he said, I know you're here. And those were his last words to me because the, the nurses were able to calm him down. And as he laid down, his mouth dropped open, which usually is not a big deal. And it happens. But he looked a little different. The nurses were saying, Garrett, you've got to breathe. And this is normally not a big deal because these oxygen levels always went up, always was, was fine. And the, so I went over there and I'm shaking him and I said, Garrett, Garrett, you've got to breathe, honey, breathe in. And as I looked at him, I looked into his eyes and they were starting to cross and then roll back into the back of his head. And I was looking at the nurses. And I said, what, what does this mean? And look, in five seconds, it was code blue, code blue. And there was a host of people that came rushing into the hospital room, all helping to try and do the CPR, this manual CPR for about 20 minutes. All this time I was looking and, and listening and watching this happen right in front of my eyes. I was praying so hard that father would save him. He was supposed to come home with me today. And then this thought came to me. It was the hardest thing I've ever been able to say or do. But the thought came and said, whose will do you need to follow? And that's when my prayers changed. As hard as it was, I said, father, if it's thy will that you need him, I'm okay with that. And with that, he was gone. Oh, my heart. I was filled with amazement, shock, compassion, and this amazing feeling of joy and love for all everybody that was in that room. I asked the nurses, I said, nurse, is there anybody here? And I was asking, is there a priesthood holder here in the room? She was able to find one. She said, is there a priesthood holder in the room? <laughs> there was somebody. And he offered this beautiful prayer. It was a sacred, holy moment. I will never, never forget. How is this possible to be filled with joy? in the midst of all this tragedy, to be filled with comfort in the midst of tragedy and change. I testify it is only through Christ I'm able to just get rid of, let go of that deep grief, that pain, that suffering, the hurt. It is he who takes it, he who has borne me up. He is atoned for my sins, for my pains, and I can let him take it. What a miracle. I will praise him forever for this wonderful, wonderful blessing. And I still feel that today. Soon after Garrett's uh, death, I was given many, many witnesses that this has always been the plan. I just didn't know about it. Brandon was supposed to go first because Garrett needed to tell his wife, his grieving wife, what had happened. And then he would come and get Garrett. Because there was a, a very big work that they were needed immediately to go right then. These two noble sons of God are home builders. The scriptures teach us that all things were created spiritually before they are temporally. In Moses 3 and 5, it says, For I, the Lord God, created all things of which I have spoken spiritually before they were naturally upon the face of the earth. I know that the Lord needed them now. They have been called to build the kingdom there in many, many ways in preparation for the Lord's second coming. Yes, 
There are pre-construction meetings up there. Yes, there are conferences to attend up there. And yes, somebody did come into the room that night. And yes, Garrett did go home that morning. I just didn't know it was to his heavenly home. We also need to prepare here on earth for the Lord's second coming. How do we draw on that power in the face of certain change and challenges? President Nelson has told us this last conference that we cannot rely on anybody else's testimony. We have to have our own abiding testimony to anchor us, or we will surely fall in the face of so much change and adversity in our lives. My testimony is that there is safety in Christ. There is peace in Christ. The more we draw ne near to him, the more he draws next to us the more he will draw close to us and we learn to trust him, to just let it go, to repent, to let him take all of that that we are having, having issues with. I testify also that the temple is a key, a very big key to drawing close to him, to obtaining his power. If I realized, if we realized how much of his power we can be given because of the temple, we would be hanging out the doors all the time. Temples have always been God's focal point for us because it's only through the temple that we become eternal families, which is God's life. If you really want to get to know someone, come to their home. Come to the Lord's sacred home to learn, to be taught, to serve this power comes through regular temple worship and work for our kindred dead, through the glorious ordinances, covenants, and promises therein. The scriptures tell us that our dead cannot be saved without us, and neither can we be saved without them. I have always loved going to the temple, but now I know and I understand more fully why I am filled and sustained with his power. So the week after Garrett's death, I went to a temple session endowment session and as i was going through the veil for my kindred dead i was overcome so greatly by those last words and those last promises i could hardly speak it was then that i realized that i'm doing work for my kindred dead but i am their posterity it's me that those blessings of power in the priesthood are pronounced we are both helped and saved together. I know that they are keenly interested in helping us. What power, what love, what joy. I feel this power every day and rejoice and praise the Lord for his goodness, his mercy, and his miraculous plan of salvation. In all the changes we experience in life, he is always there for us. We are never, ever alone, and he will take that burden from us. He will fill us with comfort. He will fill us with joy if we let him. It's only through the atonement, his atonement, that enables us for all of this to happen and allows us to be like him and to live as eternal families in incomprehensible joy and happiness, never to be separated. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.